I apologize to the member, but it is now time to move on to member's statement. Oh, I, on that note, I'm going to recognize the Minister of Community and Children's Services. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Speaker, if you seek it, you'll find unanimous consent to allow members to wear pins in recognition of May 14th being the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society's Children and Youth in Care Day. The minister is, uh, is asking for unanimous consent to wear pins recognizing children's aid societies. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. It is now time for member statements. I recognize the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, on May 4th, we were happy to celebrate International Firefighters Day. This was an opportunity to thank the firefighters of Mississauga for their service recognize their extraordinary efforts and acknowledge the sacrifices that many firefighters have undertaken to keep us safe. I was happy to hear the, that the government announcement about increasing coverage for firefighters with cancer. And I had the opportunity to visit the three fire stations in my riding, station 107, 115 and 122 to meet with the working, hard-working firefighters and thank them for their services. Speaker, this week also serves as a National Police Week and Road Safety work, uh, Week. We know the police play a critical role keeping our roads safe for all of us to enjoy. The dedicated personnel at Peel Region Police are working hard to take criminals off the street and enforce traffic laws. Speaker, the latest provincial budget announced $46 million to support response time, including purchasing four police helicopters. This will help keep our streets safe. Our government is committed to supporting police and giving them the resources they need. Madam Speaker, I am proud to be part of a government who supports our frontliners. Statements. I recognize the member for London North Centre. Good morning, Speaker. Today I mark the passing of Rod Braun, a good friend of mine, beloved of Tina, staunch New Democrat, and a kind, gentle, and loving person to all lucky enough to meet him. Rod was born in Sarnia on May 19, 1954, and earned three degrees at the University of Western Ontario, honours history, honours music, and Bachelor of Education. Rod had a variety of jobs, James Rainey Sr.'s research assistant, a journalist for several small-town newspapers, and an elementary and secondary supply teacher. Rob was passionate about music and was active in his church, St. John the Evangelist. He sang in the choir and played the trumpet for special occasions. Rod often played the last post at the funerals of World War II veterans and refused to be paid for this service. It was his way of honoring veterans. Craig Smith writes, Rod's trumpet may have been silenced, but his music will still be heard. Rod tutored refugee children and volunteered with the Am Amabile Choir. He was adamant about helping the underdog. As Rod and Tina were fond of saying, Jesus was a socialist. Now, if that confuses anyone, please be sure to go back and read it again. Rod fought for universal health care and public education. He truly believed J.S. Woodsworth's, what we desire for ourselves, we wish for all. In his final years, Tina had to fight for Rod's health care, trudging him through snow in the middle of winter to a clinic for his so-called home care. Rod fought for a system that wasn't cut to the bone and privatized. Throughout, Tina has been the example of selfless love, caring for Rod without a word of complaint. Rod died on May 12th, a week shy of his 70th birthday. He was well loved by all. <clears throat> Rod, I commit to you that I will keep you at the heart of all of my work and every decision I make here in the legislature. Rest in peace, Rod. Further member statements, I recognize the member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise this morning to talk about the long and proud hockey tradition that is part of the DNA of my riding of Simcoe Gray. In Collingwood, the tradition of junior and senior hockey goes back generations to the late 1800s with storied teams like the shipbuilders from the early 1900s, the green shirts in the 1950s, the glassmen in the 1970s, the blues in the 1980s, and the blackhawks in the early 2000s. Speaker, that tradition continues with the return of the Collingwood Blues Junior A hockey team to Collingwood in 2019, and in four short years, the team raised the Buckland Cup in 2023 as Ontario's champions. 
This year, Speaker, the Blues picked up where they left off last season, finishing the regular hockey season ranked number one in Canada, and last month they defended their Buckland Cup title. The Blues are now playing for the Centennial Cup in Oakville as one of 10 teams from across Canada vying to be Canada's Junior A Hockey Championships for 2024. The success of the Blues is a testament to the dedication of the ownership and management, the talent and tenacity of the players, and the support of the hard-working volunteers. But, Speaker, it is the fans that are the team's special sauce, faithfully packing the arena for home games, and the Blues led the league again in attendance this year, averaging over 1,100 fans per game. I want to thank the Blues, the local Junior C teams, the Alliston Hornets and the Stainer Siskins, and the many vibrant minor hockey associations throughout my riding for continuing our proud hockey tradition. Go Blues, go! go, Blues, go. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. We recently had a tenant contact our office to raise a very concerning issue. The tenant had read about the recent court decision that forced a tenant to pay his landlord's delinquent tax bill to the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, and he was concerned that this rule could affect him. Since his landlord was refusing to tell him if they were paying their taxes, the tenant contacted the CRA and asked them what he should do. And the CRA told him to withhold 25% of his rent and pay it directly to the CRA. Now, if a tenant doesn't pay on time, the CRA's website says they will pay interest and they may be fined. Now, the tenant went back to the landlord with the bad news, and the landlord said, if you withhold your rent to pay this tax bill, I'm going to evict you for arrears. Okay, so this tenant is now caught between a rock and a hard place, between having the CRA go after him for someone else's tax bill or risk eviction. And this renter isn't alone. Every renter who is living in a property owned by a non-resident landlord could be in the same horrible predicament. No tenant should have to risk eviction for paying their non-resident landlord's delinquent tax bill. This is fundamentally unfair. In this incredibly expensive housing market, renters have it hard enough. We are requesting the following measures to resolve this situation. The province should direct the Landlord and Tenant Board to deny any landlord's application to evict a tenant if the tenant is withholding rent to pay the landlord's own tax bill. And second, the CRA should work with the federal government to reverse this rule immediately and not force tenants to pay their landlord's delinquent taxes ever. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes Lakesbrock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was my pleasure to attend the Sunderland Girls Stingers Ring at Year End Ceremony this month to celebrate all their many teams' accomplishments. It was a special day for the under 14A girls team as they were the gold winning provincial champions. The Sunderland Ringette celebrates over 40 years of providing opportunities for female athletes to excel at competitive sport in a positive way, providing on ice skill and enhancing physical health and well being, higher levels of confidence and leadership, and a lot of fun. Many of these athletes start their ringette journey from as early as four years old and continue to train and compete all throughout high school. The coach of our champions, Coach Carson, was also a past ringette star before she took on the mantle of coach and she was assisted by her dad on the job. It is this generational mentorship that makes Sunderland Stingrays a formidable force on the ice in Ontario. The celebrations filled the arena with family, friends, current and former coaches and players to mark this celebration. I'd like to thank the president of the association, Jennifer Smallwood, and her team of volunteers, athletes, coaches and parents for their hard work and dedication to the Girls Ringette program. And I'd also like to thank the Sunderland Legion, who always plays a supporting role in the town and for the girls' athletes. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Mishkigawak, James Bay. Monsieur Président. Thank you, Speaker. A resident of Capus Casing would like to transfer his mother from a long term care centre in Toronto to a centre in Capus Casing or Hearst, but closer to home, where he could visit her more often. But there's a long waiting list of over two years to transfer her, her his mother, who's showing signs of loss of memory and regressing 
and she lives nine hours away simply because there's no long-term care home in your um, in your in your home community with dementia was told in the morning that she would have a bath at around two o'clock in, in the afternoon so she was ready to go for her bath in her room at that time she waited for an hour nobody came turns out they forgot we lost almost all the local staff and no, we have agency staff that speaks only English with a lot of residents that only speak French. Two years ago, this, the government announced uh, the creation of 68 beds in campus casing for long-term care home. Extended Care is asking for an extension of this project in order to put it in place. And the government isn't acting quickly enough. And this situation is completely unacceptable. We realize that in Ontario, there's one long-term care home for 170 Anglophones, but it's for 3,400 to Francophones, the ratio. Francophones deserve to receive the same level of care as Anglophones in the South, close to their families and in French. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Flamborough, Landbrook. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. I'm so pleased to rise today to recognize Jerseyville Baptist Church, a church in my riding of Flamborough, Glanbrook, that recently celebrated its 200th anniversary. I had the privilege of attending this celebration and witnessing the sense of community the organization provides for residents in the surrounding area. I was genuinely moved. I asked Pastor Matthew Richards what his, this 200th anniversary means to him and his church. He said for many years the church's stated mission has been, we will, by prayer and faith, in action, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, impact our community with the love of Jesus Christ and walk in fellowship with those who trust him. This takes place in formal times of worship and Bible teachings and also in genuine friendships within our congregation. We support with our prayers, time and resources other charities, local and global, which complement our mission. Pastor Richards explained that many of the last names of those who were instrumental in the establishment of the church are still prevalent in the community today. Clearly, these deep community roots are evident as the church celebrates 200 years of offering fellowship and support throughout the community. Mr. Speaker, I would like to again congratulate Pastor Richards and the congregation at Jerseyville Baptist Church on their remarkable longevity, and I wish them many, many more years of service to Jerseyville and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Beaches, East York. Uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker and everyone here. <clears throat> we celebrate, <clears throat> excuse me, we acknowledge spirit and spirit will come alive. This sentiment from Pauline Shirt will never be forgotten and her spirit will continue to come alive through generations to come. We sadly lost Pauline, one of Canada's most beloved Indigenous elders from the physical world, on May 7, 2024. Her spirit lives on, not only through her children and loved ones, <clears throat> but in the stories told in Indigenous languages, which she had a hand in preserving. Grandmother Nokomis, Pauline Shirt, Nimikwe, or Thunder Woman, as she was also known, was a knowledge keeper, leader and visionary, a Plains Cree elder from the Red Tail Hawk clan. Pauline and her late husband, Vern Harper, first established the Ontario leg of the Native People's Caravan to Ottawa in 1974. Their critical work did not stop there. In 1976, Pauline and Vern founded Canada's first Indigenous-run and focused school because they wanted a culturally safe and appropriate space for their son to learn. Kapapam Chukwu Wandering Spirit School still operates in the east end of Toronto today. As city councillor, I had the pleasure of engaging with Pauline on a student feeding installation at Raindrop Plaza, the first stormwater demonstration site in the city. In 2023, I watched Pauline Shirt be inducted into the Order of Ontario, the province's highest civilian honour for a lifetime contributions. 
Pauline Sherrick chose to live in our Beaches East York community at the end of her remarkable life, and there is no greater honour for me than to have represented her. Miigwech, Pauline, you will be forever remembered. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Brantford Brant. Speaker, and good morning, everyone. As you may know, May is Vision Health Month in Ontario and across Canada. Vision Health Month is traditionally a time when optometrists take a few extra moments to enlighten their patients and their communities about the significance of regular eye examinations. Maintaining good vision health is not hard. In fact, 75 per cent of vision loss can be averted through simple steps. And this starts with an eye exam. An eye exam does more than test your vision. It can also detect symptoms of diseases like diabetes, Parkinson's disease, brain tumors, multiple sclerosis, and cancer. Speaker, being able to see clearly is a critical part of maintaining a healthy and happy life. As a practicing optometrist, I am acutely aware of the importance of regular eye health examinations. Eye exams are essential for updating prescriptions for glasses or contact lenses, as vision can change over time, especially as we get older. Glasses not only correct vision, but also contribute to better eye health, safety, performance, and overall well-being, making them an essential part of many people's lives. As we celebrate Vision Health Month in Ontario, our government reaffirms our commitment to prioritizing eye health by raising awareness, encouraging regular eye exams, and ensuring access to quality eye care services. We can all contribute to a brighter and clearer future for all of Ontario. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, last Friday, the Associate Minister of Housing, the Honourable Rob Flack, and I announced that our government is providing $1.2 million to help create housing units in Whitby that will support youth 19 to 24 years old experiencing or at risk of homelessness, mental health, and addiction issues. This investment is part of the province's Social Services Relief Fund, which has provided over $1.2 billion of support to help municipal service managers and Indigenous program administrators create longer-term housing solutions and help vulnerable people in Ontario. Speaker, the Ontario government is also investing an additional $202 million each year in homelessness prevention programs, and this includes an allocation of $18.7 million to the homelessness prevention program for the region of Durham in 2023-2024. Looking after the hardworking families in the region of Durham. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning. Introduction of visitors.